Hi everyone, Zoe here. Now for today's video on Survive Mistakes, I'm going to look at making an improvised stove. Now I've already made an improvised stove for this channel in the past, the little monster IKEA hobo stove. If you've not seen the video, I'll put a link in the video description. But it's by far my most watched video, so I thought I'd listen to my audience and do another stove video. For some reason, you guys seem to enjoy them. But when I looked at the history of the IKEA stove, I couldn't really find anything about it. I couldn't find where the idea came from, if it was published in a magazine or on a blog or who came up with it. It was just muddy. When I looked into this rocket stove we're going to be building, I could find some information, although it's probably not as well known as it should be. Now, the core principles that make it effective were developed in 1982 by a guy called Dr. Larry Winiarski. Hopefully I'm saying his last name correctly. Now, Dr. Winiarski works for a company that develops, researches, and disseminates cleaner cooking technology, mostly to developing and third world nations. The idea is they're more efficient. So they use up less fuel, which takes out less of an impact on the local environment, and they give off less smoke, which means they're healthier. They cut down on lung disease, which ultimately leads to deaths. In fact, one of the figures I looked at put these deaths per year into six figure numbers. Now, we're gonna be making these out of mostly improvised parts. So we're gonna be looking at using tin cans and some wider containers. So it sounds complicated if I lay it out to you guys now, but I'll talk you through it and we'll walk through different variations, different insulation options, etc. But we're gonna be making a fuel magazine, a combustion chamber, a chimney, and an insulation chamber. Now this can be made from scavenged or recycled parts. When it comes to tin cans, I personally have a preference for soup tins. I think they're a little thicker and a little bit more durable than pop, soda, or beer cans. Now I live in the UK, if you couldn't tell from my accent. And the last thing I wanna do is alienate my international viewers by going, oh, the one thing you're gonna need is in this one UK shop and it's this one UK product that's only sold in the UK. Don't wanna do that. So I reached out on the topic of soup cans to a couple of my American viewers. By far, in the UK, the most popular soup you can get is by a company called Heinz. Now this really surprised my American people that I talked to, because they went, Heinz, they do soup? They're just a ketchup company. And they told me that by far the most popular one in their country is Campbell's, which in turn surprised me. I've probably seen more copies of the Andy Warhol painting than I have physical tins of Campbell's in the shops. So I just wanted to point out that bizarre bit of cultural difference that marketing plays. At the end of the day, a soup can is quite possibly going to be a soup can with minor variations in size, weight, maybe materials. But we're gonna be making a fuel magazine and a combustion chamber out of regular sized soup cans. Now for the first part of this rocket stove build, we're going to be making the fuel magazine, which is where the fuel goes, as if you couldn't guess for the name. We're going to be using one of our scavenged cans, and what we need to do is we need to take off the top and the bottom. Now depending on what type of can it is, that can be very easy, like in this case, or a little bit more difficult, like in the bottom's case. But there are many, many different ways, depending on what tools you have available to you, to opening a tin can. Now once you've got your can with the top and bottom off, no matter what method you've used for it, that's essentially the most basic incarnation of the fuel magazine done. There are a few modifications we can do later on, and I'll show those later. But now we need to look at doing our combustion chamber that this interface is with. Now our combustion chamber is going to be another tin can. We've left the top or the bottom on, because that's where our embers and ashes are going to accumulate. Now we need to make a hole in the combustion chamber for the magazine to go straight into. Now the easiest way I found to do this is just drawing lines on with a sharpie by using either the bottom or the top of the tin can. Now bear in mind, depending on what method you've used, they're going to be slightly different sizes. This is the interior top of the can and this is one of the bottoms which has the outside lip still on it which isn't present in the other one. So they're actually ever so slightly two different sizes. See how that one can nest in there quite easily. So if you're using a smaller lid, you're gonna be wanting to do just outside the line we're gonna be drawing. And if you're in the large one, you're gonna do one inside the line that we're drawing. But all we're gonna do 
flip the can over, stick our lid on, apply some pressure, and we're going to roughly rock it to one side because we are on a circular surface. And we're going to go around. And then we're going to keep applying that pressure and just move it slightly or move the area that I'm pressing on slightly. And we're just going to do top and bottom. I'm just going to turn this around because I am in an awkward position trying to do this. So we're roughly marred up. Again, it doesn't have to be perfect. So one option you could also do is just bending it around the lid. That didn't show up very well on camera, did it? So we got that there. Tilt it. Tilt it again. Because all I did there was draw actually on the tin can itself. There we go. So that gives you an idea of where we're going to be cutting. So here's what I've ended up with. It's not the cleanest cut in the world, but it is quite nice and circular. And all I did after doing those pilot holes was come in with a pair of tin snips and just take off these sort of ribbons and shavings of the can. So now I'm gonna fit the fuel magazine. Now, be careful doing this because some of the edges of these are quite sharp. So all I'm gonna do is slot it in one side and you can just sort of see what we've got to work with. There's still a bit of distance there. So a bit of a twist tends to help. But also because these are quite pliable, these cans, all I did there was apply pressure where my thumb is and that edge went in. Now where my thumb is now, I'm gonna put my finger on the inside, being careful of the edges, and just pry out the can while pushing that one in. And there we go. If I wanted to be a bit more secure, I can go up to these ridges and just use those as a bit more of a friction point. But there we are, a friction fit rocket stove in the most basic form, just like this one here. And they're both identical, there's no epoxy, it's just friction, apart from the height which the fuel chambers are at, which is slightly different. So before we put on an insulation chamber or go look at any of the possible upgrades, how effective is one of these gonna be as a stove just by itself?
Now, if you don't want to tidy up one of these edges with tin snips, and it can be quite a labor intensive job. One of the other options you have is not a doomsday level scenario because you need electricity and um, possibly the internet, but you need to hunt down one of these. This is the hole saw. It's a bladed attachment for a power drill and it's for making large diameter holes. Now, I managed to actually hunt one down that's almost exactly the same diameter as one of these cans I've been using. Now, I'm not sure how easy that's going to show up on camera, but hopefully you get the idea. So one day, before work, I was able to make this hole in this can, just put it in a vise, and in about a minute... I was able to make this hole a lot less labour intensive than the other version. So while I try and fit this uh, fuel magazine, which is never easy to do on camera. There we go. And because I've been filming quite a few clips for this video so far, this basic incarnation of the rocket stove, which you saw out in the snow, was relatively successful just by itself. I now have four of these. So we need some way to contain that insulation. And it's gotta be something that can really stand up to the heat of the fire. And this is where you really get to go out there and make this project your own, because there are loads and loads of different options, be it tin or ceramic. Or in some cases, I almost got tricked by ceramic that was painted to look like tin. Anyway, here's one example I've done already, just to illustrate my point. This one's made out of a biscuit barrel. So all I've done is cut a hole for my fuel magazine and slotted the stove in. And as you can see, I've got plenty of space around the edge to put my insulation materials in. But the only caveat we really need, no matter what metal thing you get out there, whether it's coffee cans or paint tins or even a bin, we basically want that whatever container you come across to be slightly taller than our cans we're using. Because if we put a pot or something on top of this and it's raised higher, there's a chance we're gonna snuff out the oxygen and kill the fire. So if you can find something that's slightly taller, that's useful because any pots or pans we're gonna rest on it are gonna rest on the rim and not interfere with the oxygen flow. And if you can find something that's got plenty of room around the edges to put insulation in, that's also a plus. If you've already liked the Survive Mistakes Facebook page, you'll have already seen this image, but these are the actual insulation chamber options I'm going to be using for the rest of the video. I've got some paint tins, an ice bucket, what was sold to me as an ice bucket, but it's essentially just a giant metal bucket, and a biscuit barrel and its corresponding lid. Now, the reason I went for these paint tins is I thought they'd be the most accessible option. And as you can see, when I put my can in there, I've got a bit of height, but I've not got much of an option for insulation. There's not much space, but they're probably one of the most easiest things to get hold of. So I thought I'd include them in this video. Now, when it comes to this ice bucket, the main reason I got it was the thickness of this wall. This is really quite thick. I assume it's not actually gonna be one solid piece of metal. It's probably gonna be uh, double walled, but I was attracted to it because of that thickness. When I put my tin can in, you can see something. I've got a lot more room for insulation, but also this is sitting quite low. So I'd have to show you how to make a chimney on top of the combustion chamber, or we could just cheat slightly and use a slightly taller tin can, which counteracts it if we use one of those for our combustion chamber. Now, when it comes to this final bucket, when I put my regular sized can in there, you can see I've got a lot of space to actually fill in. And I'm definitely gonna to need to show you guys how to make a chimney on top of our combustion chamber. And also look how much insulation I'm gonna need. This is probably not practical. I'm gonna need a lot of insulation in there, but I thought I wanted to include it just to show you guys a different option. Now, it's time for me to put these rocket stoves in these insulation chambers means I need to get happy and make some holes in these.
So, after a little while, this is what I've ended up with. Obviously for these paint tin ones, you saw me using the hole saw and the electronic drill. And for this one, I just created a simple little wire handle and I put it so it sits down flat on front so I can stack wood against it before putting it into the actual stove to dry it out, which I've not actually done for this second one yet. I might demonstrate that for you guys, but it's only a case of simply putting a hole in and then twisting some wire around. For this gigantic bucket one, all I did was put a hole in it and then basically expanded it with the tin snips until it became a circle. And I've also extended the chimney. Now, it's not actually sitting in properly yet because it's the right paint to go in. I've tried to show it on camera a couple of times, but I've got a couple of V-shapes into half a can. I'm just going to slot it into the top rim, but it's a bit of a nightmare to do one-handed, so I won't be doing that right now. And here's the one made out of a biscuit barrel. For this one, I tried a slightly different uh, method. I cut these little sort of serrations all the way around and just sort of kept expanding them if I needed more room to put the can in. Um, don't think that method really works, but it was an option. Definitely think just drawing around and cutting a circle like I did for this one, much easier. And then finally, the ice bucket. The ice bucket that doesn't have a hole in it because my drill bits will not penetrate it to the point where it's become a repository for my drill bits. And my trusty ore and demolition hammer just create glancing blows. So I'm gonna to have to come back to that one when I've got more powerful tools. <coughs> Definitely something to uh, work out now rather than when I need to rely on it in some kind of apocalypse scenario. So for the rest of the video, we're gonna be looking at just these four. Two paint tins, an ice bucket and a biscuit barrel. Sounds like the start of a very bad joke. But let's go look at some of the natural options we have for insulating the space between our combustion chamber and our insulation chamber, no matter which one we're using. So one of the naturally found insulation options you can go for is sand. If you live near the coast, that could be a really good option for you. Or in the case of this, this is an artificial beach. It was actually a quarry about 60 years ago, but it's been turned into an artificial lake and an artificial beach. But regardless, it still has sand. And that's what we'll be using as our insulation option in this rocket stove. I've got really lucky here. I found a site where there's been some kind of fire where it's man-made or natural. It's got a bit of hand and it's taken over quite a bit of land. But that means I've managed to find charcoal in the wild which when I turn it into powder with my hands, it becomes really high surface area. And it's that surface area that makes it really good as an insulation material. Now, if you can't find a fire naturally, or if you haven't been saving up your ash or charcoal from your own fires, here's another method I've come up with. Another naturally occurring insulation material you can find for these rocket stoves is actually clay. And you can find clay naturally occurring in rivers and streams. One of the things you're looking for is an overhang like this. And it's quite easy to spot clay in this one because it's a very different colour than the earth above it. So if you look here, it's very, very dark earth. But if we get closer to the water line, which is obviously there because of the waterproof properties of clay, we can find naturally occurring clay. Now clay is a really good insulator, although if you just heat it up, it will crack. But if you put a binding material like uh, straw or hay or any kind of binding material, when it heats up, rather than cracking, it'll pull at those fibres and make it really heat resistant. So, if you have the ability to get to a river or stream and you can find an overhang that has clay in it, you've got a really good insulation option for your rocket stove there. And there's one really simple way to test if what you found is actually clay and not mud or silt from the actual river. And that is, stick it in the river, give it a shake about. If it doesn't dissolve, it's clay. So and one more time, just for the sake of the camera. So I've got clay here from this riverbank. As you can see, it's keeping its shape because of the properties of clay. And I just want to test it's not mud or silt from the bottom of the river. Stick it in the river 
shake it off and it's still in exactly the same shape. So this is definitely clay. Now, if you don't want to go out there into nature and get your clay, your sand, your earth, or your wood ash, there are more industrial types of insulation that we can look at. Now, there was a couple I wasn't able to get for this video because they're usually sold in quite large quantities and it's just not financially viable for the small amount I would need for these rocket stoves. So one is fiberglass insulation. You probably got it in your walls or up in your attic. That can be used, although wear gloves because it can itch quite crazy. Or there's something called fire wool, which is again pretty similar. It's a fiberglass compound that's used in blacksmith forges and kilns. Or you can go for some of these examples that I've got. Now I went to the garden centre and got these, and I've been dreading pronouncing them. First one we've got is something called Polite? Polite? So I don't know what properties it has for planting things, it's not my area of expertise, but it is also used as an industrial insulation. It's actually um, obsidian, which is a volcanic glass. I think it's a minor mineral offshoot of obsidian, but it's quite small density and it can be quite useful for insulation for these stoves. Another one I managed to get was a much more hard to name vermicile, vermilite, vermicile, which is basically pretty similar, but this is a mineral offshoot of mica. So it's a mineral, so essentially rock, that um, we can use for insulation as well. And it is used as an industrial insulation. Now, these are quite small quantities, obviously. Um, I guess you're going to have to want me to open them so you can see what they look like. The perlite kind of looks like kitty litter. has the same kind of consistency, but as you can tell from the size of it left on my fingertips, absolutely minuscule. And then the vermulite or vermicite, or how you spell it, kind of reminds me of couscous. It's not much bigger than sand. It's a very similar sort of grainy texture. Um, there we go. That's what our commercially available options for insulation look like up close. So let's have a quick recap. This is the one made out of the biscuit barrel. So we've got a tin can fuel magazine, which goes directly into our tin can combustion chamber, which is surrounded with insulation material, in this case it's sand, and then that's contained by our insulation chamber, in this case a biscuit barrel. So the last step we've got to do is make a fuel shelf for the fuel magazine. It's going to be about a third of the way up. It's going to be the entire length of the fuel magazine. And the idea is that the fuel is going to go on top of the shelf, but there's going to be unobstructed airflow going straight through to our combustion chamber to keep the fire ignited. So let's look at the most common way of making the fuel shelf in our thing. So you guys are probably fed up seeing cans at this point. So I've got another one. I've taken the top off, I've taken the bottom off, I've gone up one edge with some tin snips and I've taken the can and have it flat against a flat surface. And that's what I've ended up with here. Basic piece of sheet metal really. And this is what I'm going to be using to make the most common version of the shelf for the field magazine. So, let's get a piece of sheet metal we've created and just eyeball the internal diameter of our combustion chamber. So, got there and there. And all I'm going to do is just extend those lines slightly. So, I don't know if you guys can see that or not, but those are the lines I'm going to be cutting down, just using tin snips. Just check the depth. Shear it off at the top. Still on the other side. Get 
it off. So, we're left with this rather odd T-shape, which is going to go inside our stove. And to secure it, what we're going to do is we're going to just make a quick snip about a third of the way up. On either side. You know what the sand flying out of it. So there we go. I've made a couple of really basic snips. And all we're gonna do is take our fuel shelf. We're going to slot it in, and then these snips are made is where we're going to secure our fuel shelf. Like so. And then all we're going to do is cut across the, cut off the excess. We're going to leave the sides. The sides is imp are important. Right, this bit's bound to be fiddly just because it's on camera. So, putting our fuel shelf, we align it with those little slits I made in the sides. Just push it in. Which we can. And all we're going to do to secure it is just bend the flaps down. So they're going to go around the edge of our can and just secure it in place. And there we go. One fuel shelf. Runs straight into our combustion chamber from our fuel magazine. Now for most people this rocket stove would now be considered done. We've got our fuel shelf installed, we've got our fuel magazine, our insulation chamber and our combustion chamber. Um, if you want to make one of these then this will be perfectly functional in its current form as this sort of basic rocket stove. It will work just as well for you. But for me, I've got a couple of concerns about the design that I just want to address. The first one is this seal around the fuel magazine. As we've already seen in the video, it can mean your insulation can leak out. Another concern I've got is actually the insulation itself being exposed to the elements. All it takes is to tip, because gravity is the only thing keeping it in, or rain to get in there, or some kind of sudden unpredictable wind. And suddenly you've lost your insulation material. So, but how are you going to contain that? Well, one of the most obvious things we could probably do is look at whatever insulation chamber we're using. If we were to put a seal around the top, so if this, like this came with a lid, we'd cut a hole in it and put another chimney coming out the top, and then that way it would contain our insulation but also not affect the functionality of the stove. But this is the real world. I've already lost most of the containers that came with lids. Um, in fact, some of the lids are actually in the boot of my car when I had an accident and the car got turned into a very small cube. So we need to look at some other kind of material that's going to be resistant to the heat of having a fire next to it, but also contain our insulation material. So here's one of the things I want to try. This stuff here is fire cement. Now it's made to be a mortar in fireplaces and fire pits. As you can see from its consistency, it's quite fluid. And the main problem with this is it's got a really, really short shelf life. This entire bucket will dry up and be completely useless within a year. But it's made to withstand heat, and because of that sort of gooey consistency, I thought it'd be perfect to smear over the top of the insulation for this rocket stove. And then once it dries, it won't have any problems with the actual heat of the combustion because it's made to withstand heat. In fact, here's a bit of an example. So the idea is just to press it down and sort of smear out the edges. And I might just go over it in a bit to tidy it up.
So there we go, just use my fingertips in a couple of minutes I've smoothed out that fire cement and enclosed our insulation at the top and also that leaking issue at the side with our fuel magazine insulation chamber and obviously you don't have to use fire cement, this is just something I had on hand and uh, we'll probably try it with clay next but just give that some time to dry and just while it was drying I decided to poke it with a stick survival mistakes so here's a couple of the uh, rocket stoves that are actually sealed with the clay from the river as you can see from a kind of aesthetic point of view they're not particularly appealing to look at but from a prepper standpoint I don't care if gear looks nice as long as it's functional the appearance is second to functionality in my eyes and that's probably the way it should always be it's not a curio that's going to sit on a bookcase and be a talking point so this one's actually sealed and insulated completely with the clay from the river, meaning this kind of coating around the uh, fuel magazine is a bit redundant. And this one is again sealed with the clay, but it's actually insulated with the uh, charcoal dust you saw me gather. Now I call this survival mistakes, not because I think I make a lot of mistakes, although I certainly do. It's about learning from mistakes. If you make a mistake in a survival situation, you might die. If you make a mistake while you're prepping and preparing for survival, then that doesn't necessarily need to be a bad thing. If you can learn from a mistake, you can turn a negative thing into a positive. For me, the negativity today is the ratio of this binder material. Now I've read online the actual ratio should be about 50-50. So 50% clay to 50% binder material, in this case, dry grass. But my actual ratio is about 90 to 10. So I'm not going to dig all this out and start again, and that's the joy of these rocket stoves, you can do if you make mistakes. But I'm going to take these out into the woods and try them as they are, and I'll learn from that mistake. Because I know again in future, if I use clay as an insulation material again, I'm not going to forget that 50-50 ratio, because I've learned from that mistake. So, let's go for the uh, bit of the video you guys all love the most, let's cue the music and go test these rocket stoves and how great they are out in the uh, wilderness. There we go, basic tin can derived rocket stoves. Now this isn't initially where I ended the video, this is actually a later update. Um, I did film a whole segment of additional upgrades and to make stoves a bit more ergonomic and a bit more efficient, but it made the length of the video a bit too much for what I was comfortable with. So I spun that off into its own separate video, rocket stove optional upgrades or something. I haven't actually come up with a title yet. So if you want to see more rocket stove action from me, go check out that video. Um, if you want to stay in touch with the channel, please consider liking it on YouTube. It lets me know I'm doing a good job. If you really liked it, please consider subscribing to the channel. I just broke 100 followers in my second year of Survive Mistakes. And if you want to communicate with me or any of my other fans, there's Survive Mistakes as a group on Facebook. And I have some of the best fans in the world. If you're watching this, guys and girls, thank you very much. Your support is very much appreciated. And finally, I'm also active on Twitter as at Zoe Survival. So if you want a few hints on stuff I'm doing for videos, there we go. So, there's only ever one way for me to end a video. And it's the most sincere thing I can ever say to you guys. Thank you very much for watching. And get out there into the impossible every day.